Oklahoma is steeped in history, from the well-known to the obscure. Most of us are aware of events like the land run of 1889 and the forced relocation of Indian nations along what became known as the Trail of Tears. Other pieces of history can be found along Oklahoma highways on those familiar roadside signs that are often glimpsed in passing but not frequently read. It's an all too common experience. You're driving along the highway and you pass a sign that says, historical marker ahead. There's history to be explored, but most of us just keep driving instead of stopping to find out what happened there. We decided to take a look. And we found this one about eight miles east of Norman on Highway 9. The marker signified an early expedition to Oklahoma by one of America's most famous writers. The centennial of Washington Irving's tour on the prairies, 1832 to 1932. Submitted by the Daughters of American Revolution and Cleveland County Teachers Association. Yes, the author of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and the creator of characters like Ichabod Crane and Rip Van Winkle visited the area 75 years before statehood. There are actually several historical markers denoting Irving's travels through Oklahoma. You can find this one near Tulsa. Another marks an Irving campsite in Arcadia. This one is located at the Santa Fe Depot Museum in Shawnee. All these markers stem from an 1832 expedition involving a troop of mounted rangers who set out with Irving from Fort Gibson in eastern Oklahoma with instructions to circle southward toward the Red River, then back to the east, a route that took Irving over the grounds hunted by the Indian tribes of the Great Plains. And he got as far west as present-day Oklahoma County and near the present-day town of Arcadia in the Deep Fork River Valley, he and his companions circled a band of wild horses. And he wrote about that later, A Tour of the Prairie, a famous book written about the American West and his experiences. Dr. Bob Blackburn is the executive director of the Oklahoma Historical Society. Blackburn says the expedition traveled through an area known as the Cross Timbers, a region of densely packed post oak and blackjack oak trees, which, according to Irving, tore the flesh of man and horse. It was like a cast iron obstacle on the plains, impossible to ride through, so you had to find your ways through it and, and around it. And so the cross timbers became famous after a tour on the prairies. Another historical marker recalls a similar military expedition near the same area. We found this sign outside the town of Noble with a title that just demanded to be read. March of the Dragoons. I'm hoping somebody can tell us what a Dragoon is. It turns out Dragoons were mounted troops sent by Congress to impress the Great Plains tribes with American power. This expedition was led by Nathan Boone, the youngest son of legendary frontiersman Daniel Boone. Boone also led an earlier expedition in 1834 that included another famous American. One thing that is notable about that particular expedition is that George Catlin, a very well-known artist who had galleries in New York City and Washington, D.C., was, was one of the premier artists of his day, wanted to come west, and he accompanied that expedition. The March of the Dragoons didn't accomplish much, but Catlin's distinctive paintings conveyed the reality of life on the plains in the 1830s. Of a, of a wonderful Wichita village, uh, near the Wichita Mountains. We have great paintings of warriors on horseback uh, riding across the plains, a buffalo hunt. So all of these scenes that George Catlin saw before photography was available, he was sketching and making notes and then later doing his paintings. Not every marker tells a compelling story. We couldn't find out much at all about Dave Blue's trading post near Lake Thunderbird other than what's written here. According to the well-worn sign, Blue hired Cherokees and Creeks to kill wild buffalo in the 1870s and deliver the hides to Atoka for shipment east. Faded lettering suggests the fate of this and some other historical markers. Those that don't speak as strongly to visitors will themselves become a relic of the past. The historical marker program began in 1949 when the legislature appropriated $10,000 for the first 100 markers. That went very well. Everyone enjoyed it, 1949, 1950. 1951, the legislature came back with a second appropriation and more. But Blackburn says legislative enthusiasm for the program faded 
and funding dried up. The Historical Society no longer encourages the placement of markers since maintenance has become a problem. We have had no funds for that. There's no central staff any longer to vet the process. And so what we have is a system of markers that is partially maintained wherever you have a local support group that wanted the marker originally and is still there and is still willing to maintain it. Blackburn estimates there are more than 500 historical markers in existence telling the unique stories of Oklahoma if only we take the time to pull over and read them. You never know what you might learn.